Hi everyone, I'm Sylvia Mascarello and I'm with Bryce McKenzie. We're with uh, Liberty Community Services in New Haven, Connecticut. And we're going to present for you some strategies to facilitate movement on what we call the employment spectrum by people with HIV. And we call our presentation, Work is Everyone's Business. Um, just to put us in the seat of this, of this um, presentation, um, this came from a special project of national significance, SPINS. And the project was called HERO, and it was uh, through Yale University, and Yale University's AIDS program subcontracted with Liberty on the demonstration project that was HIV housing and employment. So we're gonna go through the intervention that we have found some great successes with, and that intervention is called POWER. Um, just to give you a little background, and I'm sorry that I have to wear a mask, but I also wear a mask for health reasons, not for political reasons. Um, in, 19, uh, seven, in, in 2017, um, HRSA announced the availability of some Ryan White funds for a SPINS, um, and the multi-site demonstration project was called HIV Housing and Employment. It ended up being across 12 sites in the United States. States and each site um, implemented strategies to integrate housing and employment with HIV care to improve health outcomes. Um, the New ha Haven site was headed by Yale University and it was called HERO. It still is called HERO for another two months. And that's housing and employment resources for improving HIV outcomes. HERO includes the Yale AIDS program, community health care van, and Liberty Community Services. We are a housing and homeless services organization. And we implemented two interventions. On the client level, power, which is pursuing opportunities with employment and resources. And on the community level, health, housing and employment slash income coalition. And we're gonna focus on power. Sorry, everybody. Now I've got my rhythm. Uh, today, what we're looking for to um, for your learning objectives is uh, we hope to impart enough information that we can um, help you understand the concept of and gain insight into the role of all providers in assisting people living with HIV and AIDS um, in making progress on the employment spectrum, which we will talk about later. That's a concept that we're introducing here. We'd like to help you learn the key concepts necessary to develop and implement a job club to increase employment, reduce resistance and barriers and fear that people living with HIV have about employment. And we'd like to increase, help you increase your knowledge about the effect that wages have on disability benefits and how to use a customized benefits calculator that we are, will provide to you based upon your requests. It is something that is electronic. Um, I'm going to throw this to Bryce, but we maintain that work is everyone's business. And just for one second, I'm going to tell you where that comes from. I was driving down Route 84 in the uh, middle part of the state of Connecticut, and I looked at this, um, this um, board, you know, the board, the advertising boards they have. Bryce can tell me what it is if he thinks of it. Billboards. Billboard, thank you. And it said, work is our business. And it was for an employment agency. And I thought, that is such a clever way of using words. And as we were looking at our buzz line down here in the greater New Haven area, on our employment services here, I was thinking work is everyone's business, not just ours, but everyone's when you're introducing work. And I was thinking in terms at that time of the interdisciplinary team that serves people through treatment. And, um, and that kind of is a concept that has carried with us. So Bryce, is but, work their business? But it's not just an interdisciplinary team of healthcare professionals that's involved in, in, in work. It is not only the social worker or, you know, how is the social worker involved? How is it their business where they're, uh, patients and clients to gain employment uh, or to gain employment spectrum, you know, their next goal. Um, for a grocer, how would you, uh, how would that be 
their business, someone else working. It could be being able to buy that, uh, that seafood for the week uh, that pays a little more for them. It would be them being able to be hired by uh, one of the clients, one of our clients. Or it could be, you know, how landlords, how do housing providers, you know, I've been a housing provider for a few years now, and um, I know that work is, the idea of work can be very fearful, but that working with them, you can take that fear and reduce it to something that is manageable. And we maintain that work is everyone's business, and it's a broader circle than even what we have written here. And you know, if we were in person with you today, um, we would be asking you to talk about who these folks are and why would it be their business? And what have you experienced on your teams about what is uh, their business? So um, thank you for bearing with an interactive part of our, our presentation without the interaction. But um, just for us to just a little bit more, family, friends, neighbors, why would they care if someone works? There's so many reasons. Why do your neighbors need to know that you work? I think your comings and goings matter when we have neighborhood watch. Know you're safe, know you're okay. They know you're safe, they know you're okay. Why would your landlord care if you work? I think they like to make sure they get their part of the rent. Mm -hmm. And then if you look who else, just take a look at who should know and be you know, committed to you working. Now I'm gonna interact with Bryce here and I'm gonna ask him a few questions as if he is the audience for me but work is still everyone's business. What are some of the barriers to work, Bryce, that you have seen when you've encountered the people you serve? When I've been with clients, like I, I mentioned earlier, there is a fearfulness that of change. Change is, is a barrier that a lot of us have and we have to learn to work through. Um, some barriers include uh, the fearfulness of uh, losing dis uh, SSI or disability, um, the fearfulness of uh, you know not being you know getting worse more injured on the job or something else like that um, but there's also so, advantages and so you're kind of saying that fear might be one barrier to work I've seen a strong yeah fearfulness behind yeah that worry worry yeah. is more of worry a better, yeah better word yeah so fear or worry might be a barrier to work fear about how it impacts employment I mean excuse me how it impacts rights. income um, fear about change, fear about not performing well, mm -hmm. things like that. Having no work experience might be a barrier or having bad work experience. So there's a lot of barriers to work that people bring to you when mm -hmm. you present it. What about advantages that you might be talking about with work? Why would somebody want to work? Um, <laughs> I am going to mental health field with my master's and I've learned through some schooling that I've gone through that just seeing their mental, their own emotional, mental, and physical health get better because you're on a, a schedule, your, um, your self-esteem is, is, could be raised because you feel like you have a purpose now um, and you do have more income in the end, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, we know what those advantages are. The other thing is, what does a person ask you when they first meet you? And I know that you have all heard this before, but we're, we're looking at bringing your history with this uh, subject into now with a solution that we're going to go through. But, um, you know, one thing is they say, people say, what do you do? And nothing, people struggle with that answer. And, and we would like to have people be able to present with pride. I'm a student. I'm, I, I work, I'm an au pair, I do this, I do that. So we wanna help make work work, which is to look at those barriers and those advantages and help bridge over to, you know, people being able to start pushing through the fear towards the advantage. And one way that we have found it has been a thing we call, and Bryce has named, the employment spectrum. You might have in the past heard things like an employment continuum or an employment path. We instead look at the, um, the image of a spectrum. So Bryce, talk about that. So the image of a spectrum is you start, you can, you don't, it's not a linear path. 
it is not starting one place, ending one place. It is interweaving into different things, going where you're comfortable, going where your goals are. Um, whether that be coming in with something fresh and new and be like, you know what? I want to do school. I can't do work right now. So let me go to school because that still is working. You are working when you are at school. Um, it gets people to be ready to start something new and something fresh, something they may not have done before. Um, and it can help with people who have ideas and misconceptions on uh, how working actually is versus what they think or what they've heard from other people. Um, and it allows them to try new things. So it, it has a, a lot, all the little dots on this picture that we have here, they represent anywhere you can start. And you can come in from the side or you can come in from any part of this sphere, this sphere. And it could be, you know, employment, it could be volunteerism, just trying something new, learning Spanish, whatever. Chris, this again, I want to go back to your experience meeting people in introducing work. What kind of comments have you heard people say? Because I think we pulled these from what you've heard. Yeah, I've actually pulled some of these from uh, evaluations too. Um, but some people are just, they have, a, they have a friend who had a friend who heard from a friend that, you know, them working takes away all their disability and they'll get no more money and from disability, they'll lose disability, they'll never get it back. That is a huge fear that our clients have. And the truth is that is, is you know, if you stay within the certain amount was a certain amount of hours, you won't. You, you still are able to work and you'll make more than you would if you just had SSI or SSD. Um, but people who haven't worked in years, people who have never worked, they have that, that concern about what do I do? How do I do it? How do I enter a new, a, a new life or new style of life? Um, with new people and networking. Um, some people just don't have the self-esteem and they think that they're worthless and they, they can't get it done because they're not capable of it. When really they have the capability, we just have to allow them to explore it. Yeah. So what we've looked at is <clears throat> the counters to the I can't work statements that you have all heard. And you've also gotten to the bottom, which is what can I do? But with the counters to the I can't work, I'm scared, well, I've been scared before and got through it. I can't think of anything scarier than sleeping outside at night in an urban area, or even worse than that, the woods. Um, I would be terrified, and a lot of our folks have survived that. Um, how about surviving the unsurvivable, getting um, the kind of trauma people have lived through, and they are here, or getting their diagnosis, and they are here. And we want to help them discover their worth when they feel worthless. And let's look at what you can do. And we can learn that. So let's turn those into affirmative statements instead. I know that sounds a little bit new agey, but it is has value to look at it that way. So what we've discovered, or we actually put together here and discovered has merit, is a promising practice that we call power which is pursuing opportunities with employment and resources. It's an intervention that we designed to facilitate outcomes through health outcomes through employment. But what we wanted to do was bridge that fear, that lack of self esteem um, with really taking the leap to getting on the employment spectrum and making some progress there. So that's what we focus on is the employment spectrum. So we don't say, here, let's do a resume and let's get you a job. <clears throat> we work on things a little bit a little bit differently. And we're gonna to talk to you about what this practice is that we've put together and what we've learned. Um, at the front end, we had to look at, just let me take you back to this um, funding. This SPINS project was absolutely not to create a new service. It was to create capacity and to also, the way I interpreted it, was to be something of a catalyst to creating health outcomes through employment services and housing. We had already done a SPINS project where we learned quite a bit about housing and how housing, okay, preaching to the choir time, 
housing is a health intervention. People are better when they're housed. They just have better health. Um, <clears throat> so what we had to do first was say, what is out there? And having done employment services for, at this point, 42 years, I implemented the first support employment program in the state of Connecticut. And um, that was in the 80s. And I worked with every population and the HIV population, this population is somewhat new to me, but I knew to me, meaning only like only 20 of those years. Um, but what we had um, done was I had already seen many systems move from employment not being on the service plan to employment being a focus. <clears throat> when you do that, that you're really creating what's called a paradigm shift, as you know, and it is a really hard thing to change a culture of a service. It's very, very hard. And for us, you know, when we don't have employment on the service plan and something that we are really truly focusing on or, or elevating people's commitment to, um, we're not going to get there if we don't do it. But what we also have to do is see what's already out there. You don't want to duplicate what's out there. So we, our first point was to identify resources in our community, which we were pretty well aware of. Having been around a long time, I know everybody, I know what they're all doing, and I know how they do it. So we put together the resources on a resource assessment on employment services and those related employment services like training programs. And then we looked at how do they get access to what are eligibility requirements? Who are the gatekeepers? What I had discovered was that ASOs, AIDS, AIDS service organizations, serving people who are in the HIV world, had not been accessing a huge amount of those employment services that were absolutely available to the people they served. They just didn't even know about them or how to get there. So instead of duplicate, you know, just saying, oh, good, let's do a support employment program, we said instead, there are employment services out there. They have capacity on their wait list. How do we get there? How would that, a gap was between the person needing the service and the service. So we looked at that and then we looked at the gaps. What is missing? Why are people not using them? What are the trends and what can we do? And what we really came down to, what was missing was knowledge and relationships. So we looked at this on the client level and on the community level. On the community level, which is another intervention, we did some work to break down some silos. But on the client level, we said, let's get people together. Let's inform them of what's out there and how to do it. And we um, went forward with power. So the model that we focused on was, those of you who've been around a little bit have heard about something called the job club. A job club is a networking or job search club, and it's a group of job seekers. Now, it has a specific type of a structure. It is not a promising or evidence-based practice. It's an old model. It was around, I think, with veterans and I think maybe even World War II veterans is how old it might be. But it has kind of had it come into favor and out of favor. But I looked at it having never done one in any agency I worked in. And I thought, this might be the step we need here. Let's just take a look at this thing. And I pulled a lot of data or, excuse me, a lot of information about job clubs, structure them, how you might go about starting one, pulled it together. And it does things like, you know, mock interviews, sharing leads, things like that. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think common sense is a really good way to start. And so for us, power is an intervention that was developed, again, we, to bridge the gap between barriers and work or forward movement on the spectrum, to demystify false assumptions and build working relationships between the people we serve and untapped resources. Um, we did um, have all of our staff and all the people that were working on our project and at all the sites on this SPINS project had to take the curriculum, participate and complete the curriculum for the Getting to Work Technical Assistance Initiative, which is a partnership between the USDOL and HOPWA, so, and HUD. And they were looking at housing, people with, people with HIV, 
and introducing employment services. So that is a, um, a training that's available online. It is a three-part uh, certificate, quick certificate little training. And it gets everybody kind of on the same page when they're talking about it. Um, power also brings high visibility of, uh, to employment of the people we serve to our organization, our consumers, staff, and community partners. And it has done that. We can't wait to tell you about the impact, but that's a little bit down. So the first thing that we have to do for implementation is identify the lead in our organization. That was the one thing that I had to do. And what I did is I said, Bryce, you're the lead. Tell them how you went about it after I gave you the information on job clubs. So the very first thing you should do is um, actually talk to the clients, the people who are going to be involved and what their needs are because you're working for them, you're working with them. And that is the best way to get a, an outcome that is beneficial to everyone is finding out what they want. Um, from there, you uh, take inventory of uh, possible partners that you might have in your community, whether it be the local library, um, a volunteer organization, uh, colleges, GEDs, things like that, um, and also employer programs and services, but also take into account bus routes wherever you are, because we know that our clients Unfortunately, many of them do not have vehicles or driver's licenses of their own, so they have to take public transportation or bike. Um, so we're always made aware of wherever this is has to be um, within reach of our clients. Um, also looking for uh, job fairs, banks, and employers that may come around. Um, see who your friends are, see who your acquaintances are, See, like where your barber is. That's how I found out who would be willing to do hair, uh, free haircuts because I just brought up the, the job club idea and they were like, you know what, I'm having a nonprofit and we're cutting hair. And after, you know, they did a few cycles and then we went to a hair cutting school that did it for free. So they do pro bono work for us, for the community. Um, you also have to make sure you have the resources uh, such as uh, computer accesses, we are lucky to have a uh, computer lab where we are. Uh, make sure you have bus passes to get your, your participants to, uh, whether it be to group or if they actually do have eventually have a job interview, help them get to that job interview. Um, clothing that would help with them, such as socks or, or any items, uh, snacks, because we know that sometimes the only meal that our client may be eating is that one meal a day. And anything to, to help bring the food will uh, get people in and get people seated and actually listen and vibrant. Um, but we also have writing tablets or books, pens, and other things. Um, and you have to find out who are you willing to do the work. It is work. For the first, it took me about, from the start till I came up with the calendar, about two weeks. And from that point, um, I had laid the groundwork of what I thought power would look like, uh, but wasn't completed because we're constantly changing, depending on what each consumer needs and what the, the evaluation show. So. Yeah, and for me, identifying a lead was easy. And for Bryce being able to commit the time wasn't actually a choice. He, it was his assignment. So, um, we were going in the right direction. However, you can see that while it's intense time at the front end, we're talking about two or three weeks of intensity where that was really what he, he really only did that, which was pulling that together, connecting with people. Um, the structure, Bryce, tell about that. Uh, so we structured it in that we have cycles. Each cycle is about eight weeks. Um, and each week has two modules, uh, which and each week has a theme. A uh, module lasts about two hours because we know that sometimes um, they might get tired early because you know they've had a long day or their medications are now setting in. And we learned that if it's later in the day, it's too much. You know, it doesn't. It takes away from what they can do. Um, 
but we also have the themes for the week. And each week's themes could be anywhere from the first week of orientation to financial empowerment, to education, to jobs, to strength building, which is a huge thing to do, build on their strengths. Um, we also have scales. Uh, the scales of self-efficacy, self-esteem, and self-care. It is a research study, and this helps promote um, the, what can actually be done through power. It helps back up, to not just what we're saying and what the clients are saying, but on paper, what we have. Um, always willing to make adjustments. Integrating themes uh, based on consumer input, such as reentry or legal issues. So when we did mid-session evals, we realized we were missing some issues. Um, and so on the second half, we actually found some time to bring in those people to help the, the clients who had backgrounds or legal issues or, C or something with human rights and, and discrimination for CHRO to come in. Um, we then also made sure we had involvement with community partners, such as the local community college, um, any volunteer organizations or hospitals that volunteer, cosmetology school for the free haircuts. Um, banks teach about financial literacy, library to not only talk about computer access or how to do computer classes, but to talk about how to volunteer and then just mainstream employment resources. Mm -hmm. um, Bryce is going to show you, you know, as visual learners, since you really have to visualize what we're doing and listen to us. Um, Bryce, why don't you show them what that cycle looks like? So this is about the, the more recent one. As you can see, it was September, basically last year. Um, what we start on is introduction, guidelines, and expectations. It's not our expectations of you, it's what you should expect coming from power. What are we going to provide that you can use as resources? Um, before every uh, cycle starts, we can do a one-on-one -on -one with the person just so they know what they're getting into so they're not surprised going in, you know, because they don't know everyone there. They might not know anyone there. Um, they might only know you as a facilitator. And you as a facilitator are there to guide but not to teach. Um, and then that whole, that whole first week is just identifying those strengths that they have and building on it. And then we go to the computer lab. We, we identify our resource blog that they can use for uh, job hunting skills. Um, we produce a, a personal resource inventory, which is um, goals, basically. Uh, goals on what they want and how they want to achieve it. Um, we establish their work emails and phones because some people don't have phones and you need to learn how to use computers now to be able to get a lot of information across. Uh, then we do resume building. We give them a resume builder, an actual thing that they fill out. So they are not only um, creating their resume draft, but they give us an idea to help them put it, structurize it. Um, and then we go to Computer Lab and we help them create and update resumes. Yep. Um, I just want to say that I am working out a way to be able to give you every tool that we talk about. We will package that so it can be gotten out to you and you can use that if you'd like to. And um, with strengths, I, one of the things that we would really like to share as a practice that we started as well is people either self-refer or are referred by a case manager or someone they're working with elsewhere. And that is to give us the information on how to, how to reach the person, understand that they you know, have been given some information about it, but we ask the case manager or sending person to answer, to tell us one strength about that person that is authentic and they have observed so that we can start, you know, harvesting um, a lot of feedback about that. So for instance, if the case manager said he always keeps his appointment or they always, um, they always come dressed ready to, to, to work or uh, she's got a really kind way, so understanding and really has learned to, the, her resilience is what we see. So that kind of stuff, we want to know that at the front end so that we can, you know, take opportunities to reinforce that and to have that person understand that there are things valuable and they are building on strengths, really something to start with. 
Um, so further on, after the first couple of weeks, the facilitator takes a major step back and it's the um, community leaders that come out and people who live it day in and day out um, who come in and speak to the um, participants. And they tell, you know, about financial literacy through entrepreneurship. We give them uh, YouTube videos on, we were able to get secure uh, USBs and we give them those USBs to be able to watch the videos when they have time at like the library or somewhere else. Or, um, you know, we could give them a resume on it too. That way they can easily just plug it in and then pop it up on there. Um, we do the volunteering. We have uh, different organizations come in to talk about that. Um, we talk about disability and wellness and their health. And we talk about how health is and wellness is a very um, key component to be able to continue to work. You have to be able to maintain your physical health, emotional health, mental health to be able to work, go to school, volunteer, whatever it is you, you want to do. Um, and then we do have people who come in for employment um, and they talk about, you know, hiring processes or talk about skills where you have to go to job interviews or, you know, have any questions. They we leave free time to be able to do that. We give it 45 minutes per person. We do two per, per uh, day. Um, and that way, in case someone has to pull out, which inevitably at least one, happens once, because you see the crossed out line, um, it's because we have that free space where if people have more questions, they have that opportunity to continue asking. It's not just shut down. And then uh, what everyone loves at the end is we go having a grooming and personal care day where we hand out uh, bags of, of trinkets to, to clean yourself with, uh, we have hand sanitizer, we have uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, combs, razors, and then we actually go for haircuts for free. And they're able to decide what their haircut is, not that necessarily the styling, like blow dry it out or anything, you know, like a fair cost thing or anything like that. Yeah. They actually get their hair cut and, and washed. Um, and then at the end and mid-session, we do um, cycles. Um, yes. The cycles, we do the um, evals. We do that to make sure that we are on the track that they need to get what they want out of the program. Mm -hmm. And then we also do the scales at the beginning of the cycle, so that very first day and at the end to see if there has been any change. Mm -hmm. Also, what we found out is um, without even us realizing it, we had former participants who actually wanted to continue coming for support from their, their peers. So they created graduate graduate sessions where, you know, once a week for an hour or two, they come in, they talk, they, they see where they're at, and we, we update them with anywhere that's hiring, anywhere that's school, anything that's happening, we let them know, and then they can discuss with each other, and they have snacks there too. So it's, it keeps them occupied and gives them somewhere to go and feel okay. Yeah, and they, you know, I think that everybody wants to have a peer-run group, but every time you try to do that, that doesn't get peer-run. That's us run still. And what we said when they brought to us that they wanted to do it, we'll provide the space, we'll provide the supplies you need, you just have to provide the people in the seats and you lead it yourself. We promised you at the beginning that we would talk to you about benefits and earned income. That is a very important thing to get over. It's a really important part of our, um, of our intervention is teaching people, if you work, what it's gonna mean. Um, so we put together this calculator, which is on an Excel spreadsheet. If you look at this, you see two blue arrows. On a spreadsheet, you know that we use formulas. The only place there are no formulas is where the two blue arrows are, where you can enter what the projected income is for someone and what their SSI cash amount is. Um, we calculate um, what it means if you rate, make some money. So let's just take an example. The federal uh, payment standard right now for SSI is $783. There are these exclusions called general income exclusion and an earned income exclusion. If you ever wanna do yourself a favor, download the um, Social Security Red Book. It has so much information in it, you just can't imagine. And you can find it very quickly if you've got it electronically on your, your um, 
your computer. And these exclusions have stayed the same since the 1980s, I think. That number is ridiculous, but that's what it is. Um, so for instance, when you see that, you have a total of $85, which is taken off the top. So if a person were to make $600 gross earned income a month, we would subtract the $85 from that and then divide it by two. That becomes the countable earned income. And that is the number that's subtracted from the social security cash amount. So of the 600, they are only counting of that 257.50. So we subtract that and then your new SSI cash amount would be about $525. If you look at your income, plus the new cash amount. Um, in this scenario, it would be about $1,125 the person would have as their monthly income. And that's up quite a bit from 783. However, we do know that as your income rises, your contribution to other things rises too. So we take a look at how does that affect your income, uh, your um, rent. Typically, the folks that we serve, we strive to get them in a um, subsidized housing if they are only on SSI or they, have, they really do not have um, a large income. If they're on SSDI, their income could be a lot different from this. But we're talking about SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. Um, so the rent responsibility is typically 30% of their income. Um, on scenario one, when the person got $783 a month and did not work, their rent contribution was $234.90. Um, if they work, like I said, with the increased income comes increased liability. So in this scenario, the rent goes up about $110. So your income prior to working is $783. After you've paid your rent, you have $584.00 to cover your other costs. If you work and you make $600 a month, and that's actually like working about maybe 10 hours a week or 12 hours a week, 10 or 12 hours a week, um, your income after you pay your rent, which is the higher amount, would be about over $200 more a month. So I don't know, I think that's better than not working. Um, and in Connecticut, you also have to look at how, uh, not just Connecticut, anywhere, you have to look at how it affects SNAP. So take a look online and you'll be able to find out how SNAP is affected by working your, your uh, food stamps. So what does it basically mean if you work and you receive a benefit? It means that if you have disability work income, you can work. Anyone who works will have more money each month to live on, period. It's very clear. Um, so I just went the opposite direction. Sorry. Anyway, let's talk about the impact of this, um, of this project. And this is a very exciting place for us. Um, starting point, you want to know how many people were touching. This was actually a three year, um, demonstration project. It took a year to ramp it up and develop the, um, and develop our interventions. And then we probably did a full year of actually doing the interventions. We would have done 18 months, except I don't know if you noticed, but there's a little virus called COVID-19 that has interrupted how all of us do our work. And so we had to stop doing groups where people are face to face in the room. And we're spending a lot of time right now trying to figure out how we're gonna proceed with safety and social distancing. And we are looking at spaces now to be able to bring us back together. So 54 people re requested information, were referred for the service, requested information about the service, were given their one-on-one, -on -one, and completed the orientation with the group. 42 stayed in it. So that's 12 people didn't stay. All right. That's good that three, two -thir I mean three quarters of them wanted to. That's good. We administered three scales, self-efficacy, self-esteem, and self-care pre and post. As you can see, the self-care scores that we're reporting to you are up. We did not see significant change in self-efficacy or self-esteem. We saw the changes in self-care. And we have some thoughts as to why that may be, but um, 
let's just focus on where we see a difference and and what this begs for is more looking at this and seeing is it the degree of the amount of classes they went to what it, is it what were their goals maybe those things impact it don't know but the fit there are four domains on the self uh care um scale which is physical psychological emotional and spiritual we see actually score you know increases that are worth looking at four percent almost five percent and then eight percent on psychological the way that they're what they perceive as their psychological wellness um we don't know what that means but we look, hope to discover that and we are you know talking with a couple of different um funding sources about bringing this to the next level to do some more work and more research to see if power can be an evidence-based practice. With regard to employment spectrum movement, we saw a lot of great stuff too. Let me give you a, for instance, however, on where we were prior to power. I think our folks that we served who had HIV, who were, we were, and we were born as an HIV organization in 1987, so that we do serve a lot of people who are living with HIV. Um, Seventy-one percent of our enrollees achieved progress on the employment spectrum. We're always drawing our percentage from the forty-two, per, the 42 people. Sixty percent of those enrollees secured paid employment. That's up a lot from the five percent we might have seen prior to this. Seven percent entered educational or training programs, and eleven percent uh, took on volunteer jobs. Um, we're really excited that it was there was a consumer involvement in real um, real participation, which is the feedback that changed the service that was used for that. We all hear nothing about us without us. Well, this is how you can make sure that there is nothing about us without us, that you talk to the people you serve before you endeavor to do something. Make sure that it's they're part of what you design and that they continually have in, uh, opportunities for in, input. And then the, grav, the graduate groups with the self-led groups, that's a real exciting side impact of this. This was not, the graduate groups were not something we wanted to particularly make happen, but we're really excited that they did. Um, that takes us to the end of our formal presentation. Again, um, I believe that we are gonna have some time to talk to you. And if you want any more information, this is our contact. Please reach out to us and we're happy to share with you. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you, my pleasure. Take care and thank you.